Hey, what's up, Cashflow Hackers? It's Chris with Life 180, and for this video, I'm doing something a little bit unique. I was interviewed by a gentleman named Robert Lee. He works with the Banking Bros guys, does a lot of really cool stuff. He's launching his own podcast, and what I'm gonna do in this video is just share the interview that I did with him on his podcast. Now, I normally, when I go on somebody else's channel, I don't take their channel and put it on my channel, their content that for, that's designed for their channel, put it on my channel, but a, this guy's a really good guy, and I really encourage everybody to go and subscribe to his channel. Check him out. He's on Instagram. He's on YouTube. He's all over the place. I'll put his links in the description below. But on top of that, we had a really, really good conversation that covered a lot of things to do with different, um, different things in the IUL space, in the whole life space, and just kind of like the life insurance space in general about investing, about different sales schemes uh, that are happening with uh, Index Universal Life around the, in, around the country uh, that he addressed and I was able to kind of get into things in a way that I haven't really talked about on this channel before. And so I asked him, he said uh, that absolutely share it here. And so I would encourage everybody to go check him out. But without further ado, we're just gonna get into the interview. I hope you enjoy. If you haven't already, make sure you're subscribed and hit the bell. That way you're notified every time I launch a new video. Let's go. Hey guys, welcome back to the BI Breakdown. I'm happy to have Chris Kirkpatrick here for a part two. Uh, the first time we got to talk about a lot of interesting things. So this time we're looking to take some of those same concepts and break it down, help you understand personal finances, uh, everything from you know budgeting your money and, and what can you do differently, understanding the world of money, inflation, how is that going to be impacting you? And also too, investing and how you could potentially build a business. So uh, Chris, thanks for being on, man. And you know, before we go any further, tell us a little bit about some of the things you've been doing, some of your trips. I know you've been traveling a lot. Give us a little bit of an update on, which, on what's going on with you, man. Yeah, yeah man. No, thanks. It's been awesome. Uh, it, you know, I know we've been trying to get this get this interview in for a minute, right? Like it's, uh, yeah, I've been yeah. all, all over the, all over the map. I feel like, um, we are, I, I'm launching a real estate investment fund right now. Um, okay. and so I'm on top of everything else I'm doing, I'm going to, I guess, be a fund manager at this point in time, starting in about 20 days. Uh, so that's pretty cool. Um, doing a whole project down in the Dominican Republic. Um, just, uh, got, uh, just got kind of under contract for, um, our first investment for the fund, which is a hotel that we're buying pretty much right on the ocean, uh, down there on, on the North shore on the North side of the Island, which is pretty awesome. Mm. Um, so, uh, we're doing that. That's pretty cool. Um, but then obviously also running life 180 and just doing my thing. Um, wife and I did an ayahuasca retreat, which is pretty fun. Um, went down to Columbia, uh, did that. That was awesome. Um, but you know, just, just trying to grow, trying to seek, trying to, you know, challenge, challenge myself. And, um, I'm, I'm one of those people that's always kind of questioning my own beliefs and my own way of doing things and trying to grow. And, um, you know, and that's, that it was a, it was a beautiful summer because we were able to, uh, take about a two and a half month trip, uh, going from the Dominican Republic to Colombia to Las Vegas for the world series of poker and, you know, kind of working and, you know, doing self work in between everything. And so it was, uh, it was pretty awesome. Man, that's awesome to hear, dude. I never understood the game of poker. I'm going to get into it. I haven't understood the the game of poker, but to watch it, yeah. I've always watched it uh, when they had like the tournaments online and, and whether yeah. they had it on TV, I would, I would watch the tournaments because it was very, very serious. I knew when one person is changing some chips to another person, they just lost some money. So that's, <laughs> that's, the, part, that's yeah. the part I understood the most. Now, I want to dive into one thing you just said that was really, really powerful, questioning what you know and always what kind of like your truth or what you think is uh, uh, what you think is right. That's so powerful, yeah. man, because I think that like I, I did an interview with Chris Noggle. Of course, you know, Chris Noggle. Yeah, and of we were talking about a lot of some of the same stuff, uh, you know, from politics to how the world is ran as, as far as economics. Uh, and yeah. he's the only other person besides yourself that I've been able to have that kind of conversation with on the platform. So mm -hmm. I think it's important now more than ever is uh, is for everybody out there. We all need to question the truth. Because the truth is the truth. It's not my yeah. truth. It's not your truth. It's only the truth. And yeah. I think that's, you know, it always needs to be questioned. Anything that cannot be questioned, it mm -hmm. can't be the truth because it, yeah. it takes away an opposing side. Uh, so, man, it was crazy. Is that's it's a, it's a perfect lead up to all the stuff, all the stuff that we're going to get into. So what <laughs> I want to start with is uh, I want to start with inflation. OK, so last time we talked, uh, we were going into inflation a lot. 
I'm going to give a generalized breakdown and then we kind of go from there. So cool. guys at home, <clears throat> I have a series that goes through uh, inf- inf- more than just infinite banking. It goes into financial education and it's a playlist on this channel. So make sure you click on the financial education playlist. If we're talking about a lot of things, that's just going right over your head. OK, you need to click on there. You need to watch that so that you can understand what me and Chris or any any other guests is talking. And we're trying to you know, we're kind of using that lingo that financial uh, jargon, you need to know what we're talking about so you can follow along. Make sure you click on that playlist. But fi- uh, inflation in itself and what it is, it is the printing of currency that causes inflation. So the dollar that we use to buy things is chasing a limited amount of goods and services. So when you buy things that are limited, like housing, like food and beverages, it's going to cause the price of those things to rise because the dollars are forever expanding. So I go into, like I said, I go into a deeper concept of what inflation is and exactly how it affects you. But I'm going to let Chris now give us a little bit, you know, expand on what inflation is, Chris. And I want to, I have to get people to understand the problem. Uh, You might know Jason Lowe as well. So I interviewed Jason Lowe. And yeah. um, he was saying, Rob, I think we're giving a lot of people the solution. We're banging them over the head with the solution, but they don't understand the problem. So we mm. got to bring them back to the problem. So everybody inside this space, whether it's uh, investing, you know, the yeah. banking space, infinite banking, I think we all have a, a paradigm shift that we came across where we understood, we looked at the system and we looked at the problem first and we said, okay, this is a problem. Something's wrong with the world. Something's wrong with the game of money and how mm. we're currently playing it. We need to play it a different way. So expand on inflation for me, if you would. Well, I think that before even going into that, kind of like expanding on what you just said is one of the things that I kind of tell people as I'm coaching them with their money is the number one problem that we have in this world, and especially America, you know, the US and Canada, is that people's money and their financial strategy is not in alignment with their own values and their own beliefs. And I think one of the challenges there is that people are not really clear on what they even believe and what they even know, right? Like, you know, people just kind of like go through life like a zombie and, and just go to, go to their job and come home and hang with their family and watch Netflix and do their thing. And they're not intentional about really learning like what is impacting their life. They're not intentional about what they're actually trying to create out of life. And if, if you don't understand what you're trying to accomplish and what you're trying to live life for, and then kind of reverse engineering that and learning, um, you know, about uh, what you need to do to accomplish it and and to be intentional about uh, being successful and creating that life that you want to live, then it's really easy to, to live out of alignment with what you truly believe and what you truly value. And, um, you know, I think that's where we kind of back our way into like thinking about these things like inflation and, whatever, because at the end of the day, I mean, you, you said it, inflation, money printing is a part of inflation for sure. Um, but inflation is, is also a supply demand issue, right? Like we can have, we can have inflation. Um, they had inflation before money printing existed, you know, inflation would go through these boom bust cycles before. So uh, it was, it was, yeah, it was just different. It was like, it was based on supply and demand and it was based on, you know, like for instance, oil, right? Like if we had no money printing, Oil would go up and down in value um, based on our, our the world's ability to produce it and you know process it and distribute it to different parts of the world and you know all these different things and uh, so that's just one example but it's supply and demand and money printing and monetary policy interest rates um, you know are the the idea is you know the Keynesian economic theory. Um, you know, would say back in the, the 20s when it really, really got nuts, would say that uh, that economists are smart enough to uh, to control uh, the economy and they can do so by expanding the monetary uh, system by reducing interest rates, because when you reduce interest rates, you inject a lot of money into the into the currency uh, population uh, currency base. And when you raise interest rates, it's basically like people have to pay more in interest that goes into the banks. And we basically light that money on fire um, and that that money gets taken out of circulation. And so then um, the idea is in times of hardship, the Fed is supposed to be able to reduce rates to inject more money to make life easier for people. And as times get better, we're supposed to raise rates. And, um, you know, because the economy is, quote unquote, healthy, um, you're not supposed to feel it. Right. Like that's the idea. Yeah. Um, 
that's been a flawed system and there's been a lot of uh, kickback on that for a hundred years at this point in time. There's been kind of two sides of the debate, but I think we're at the time now where the debate is over um, and people are realizing like, you know, we had last year the first time uh, with an inverted yield curve, we're going into a recession. And uh, the first time that the market lost and bonds lost in the same year. So there was no, there was no safe haven. The only asset, by the way, that didn't lose was whole life insurance. Just want to throw that out there. Uh, yeah, man, that's crazy. Uh, diving into what you were talking about is I, I wanted to touch on some of the things where you're talking about inflation and, and how mm -hmm. it's not necessarily just the printing of currency. Yeah. So print the printing of currency drives inflation, right? Because it, mm -hmm. it, it takes away the freedom of the market. So mm -hmm. like with the yeah. interest rates going up and down and them trying to control it, yeah. the Keynesian economics uh, behind that is the economists are saying, well, we, c which is the opposite of freedom, in my opinion, we can mm -hmm. control the factors of production by controlling the monetary, like you were saying, it's, uh, the fiscal policy, mm -hmm. uh, expanding and contracting the monetary system as far as currency, uh, and also, too, mm -hmm. controlling those interest rates uh, via the Fed. So we see mm -hmm. these boom-bust cycles and these business cycles where if you see, like, for an example, during the... Uh, the pandemic, we had, mm -hmm. we had, uh, we had the, the health crisis that was happening at the same time. What happened? Yeah. You seen people go from almost, you know, millionaires to billionaires, billionaires went from billionaires to almost trillionaires, right? People didn't mm -hmm. understand the economic shift that was happening when people were doubling and tripling their net worth. For an example, uh, you seen Jeff Bezos and Elon Musk. I believe those two were swapping spots for the richest, uh, the richest men in America. They kept they kept yeah. uh, sw uh, swap uh, yeah. swapping spots because what oh. happens is the people that control the assets and and they own the things that go up in value that the dollars purchase, they become wealthier over time. And so I think that's the thing mm -hmm. about inflation and what hurts us is people don't understand how your dollars that you're working for, if they're devaluing themselves over time you then have to work harder or you have to do more. Either you're going to have to work harder for that dollar or you're going to have to find a way to make that dollar work harder for you. And so that leads me into my next thing is, you know, why and how infinite banking? So uh, most people just from our conversation already, we can't help but talk about it because, you know, that's the that's what we're in. That's the industry. Uh, so yep. you said your whole life insurance didn't lose. So it would it, in some way, shape, uh, shape or form, it's a solution, right? It was a hedge mm -hmm. against, uh, what was happening now also too one thing that you didn't mention uh, is the precious metals mm -hmm. now oddly enough gold underperformed but mm -hmm. what did perform and what did not lose we had other precious metals uh so platinum for an example copper did a historic run around the same mm -hmm. time so we mm -hmm. did see precious metals in general uh also be a safe haven in a hedge so Mm -hmm. That's uh, that's a what I would consider real money. Hard money is precious metals. The dollar and the uh, the currency fiat currency system is mm -hmm. supposed to be backed by those things, but they're not. I call those fake money. Uh, so rich dad, poor dad, Robert Kiyosaki, the author, he always talks about uh, you know fake money. His new book mm -hmm. out is fake. Yeah. If you guys definitely want to check that out and read that, that helps you wrap your mind around uh, inflation, what's going on with the currency system as well. So dive a little yeah. bit into now that we understand a little bit more of the problem, even though it's a, it's a very expansive problem, it becomes more and more over time. And, and there's a lot of pieces to that puzzle. We know enough uh -huh. about the problem to understand why we need some kind of a solution to it. So why and how is infinite banking a solution? Well, I think it, it all boils down to control. Uh, I always, I always kind of tell people that the 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 solution to all this is just focusing on financial structure um, and not worrying so much about rate of return on investments that we make. I think one of the uh, one of the biggest lies that we're told is the younger we are, the more risk we can take. Um, you know, I'm 43 now, and this is something I wish I'd learned when I was in my early 20s because I was taking a ton of risk. I lost a lot of money. And had I known then what I know now, my life, uh, as good as it may be, uh, you know, would be a lot better, right? Like I'd have a lot yeah. more, a lot more, uh, you know, assets under, under my belt here. And so, um, and the real, think about it this way. If we understand the concept of risk and we understand the concept of market cycles and, um, the idea of, 
trying to make money when everybody else is making money is just a flawed, a flawed way. I mean, think about it this way. People, what, what is, what is the, the, the traditional methodology of, of financial planning in the United States? It's go to school, get a job, invest in your 401k, qualified accounts, buy and hold and accumulate assets over this period of time in these accounts that the government control. And hopefully 30, 40 years from now, you'll have a pot of gold at the end of the rainbow. But the problem is, um, you know, 95% of people, I would say, oh, let me say this. The problem is I would call the traditional financial system right now, a failing financial experiment. And the reason I say that is because if you look at 401ks, IRAs, stuff of that nature, I'm older than those accounts, right? And so we mm -hmm. now have the first generation of people that are getting to retirement that have used those types of accounts for their, the entirety of their you know, career to save for retirement, to try to reach financial independence, which is ultimately all we're trying to do to hit retirement, right? And 95% of people are not able to maintain their standard of living and be financially independent when they hit retirement. So that's, to me, that's just showing it's a failed financial system. And, you know, when we look at like why, and if we really, because I'm a big like, okay, that's great that the numbers are what they are, but the question is why is that the case, right? And so I look at it and it's like, okay, let's not look backwards, let's look forward um, because the world is moving much faster in 2023 than it was in 1983, right? When people maybe started this journey, if, you know, people when they started their career in, in their mid twenties and now they're retiring, you know, 40 years later, uh, the world is moving faster now than it was during their career. So we can't think about it in the same terms. And the question that I have to you is like, with the national debt at 30 whatever trillion dollars that we're at right now with uh credit remember card I debt told you we're going to 40 trillion last time we talked dude, remember I, I told know. you I told you dude with consumer debt consumer debt household debt is over 17 trillion right now with 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 everything the way that it's going right now with interest rates going up with inflation uncertainty with political uncertainty with taxation uncertainty all these things if you think about it the way that the government gets people to save for their retirement and the, the whole idea of buy and hold and hope and ride it out and just maybe you'll get there when nobody's succeeding. The three variables of political risk, inflation risk, and taxation risk that are going to impact you, that are going to have a negative impact on, in you, on you based on just where we are right now. If you think about that you and you put your money into that system, to delay having to deal with all that, I promise you, you're going to pay the price. And so where I think the re and like, listen, I, I go back to like, why, why, once again, I'm always looking at why is this the case? Why? And not, is that bad? Because I think we can all say, yeah, it's bad. But the question is it's why? Bad, and I think yeah, right? it's, those, it's those three variables, right? And so then people go, why do you do what you do? Why do you love infinite banking? Or like, I don't even like to call it infinite banking. I know that's like the marketing term. And I know like yeah, Nelson Nash yeah. and all that stuff. And it's great. And I no, no, not disparaging it. You know, I'm just saying like, I just like to look at why do I love whole life insurance, right? Like, cause that's what it comes down to. Why do I love a properly designed whole life insurance policy in my life? Because it forces me to think about human life value. It forces me to think about what do I want to create and who do I need to become to live the life that I want to live and create the life that I want to create for my family. And it's the idea of saving before I invest. It's the idea of positioning myself for opportunity in different market cycles and positioning myself to keep my safe, liquid, accessible capital in a place that's going to beat what the banks do, you know, and, 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 and it's all to me, it's about control. It's it about, it's about options, right? And it's about putting myself in a position where I am the, uh, the pillar of success in my own life. I'm like, I, I talk about this in my book that I have coming out and it's, it's the five F's of life, faith, family, finances, fitness, and freedom, right? And so yeah. we know, we know everybody, like at the end of the day, we're all after what? Freedom, financial independence, right? That's, that's the goal. That's what retirement is. Now, why has everybody bought this lie and myth that we're supposed to wait till we're 65 to do so? Now, that's, first of all, it's just stupid. You know, like that's just, like that's just scarcity thinking like to think that you can't that you got to go to school get a job work for 45 years you know and and maybe reach success and 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 be unhappy the entire process to get there 
and then ultimately feel unfulfilled and uncertain about what the rest of your retirement is going to look like, that's not a fun life. And that's a re- like, I think that's a big issue. But like, I think the reason is because we know that when it comes to our faith, we cannot outsource our success with our faith, right? Like we got to read the Bible. It's a, it's we a gotta, personal thing. Yeah. It's a personal thing. We got to take accountability for our relationship with God, whatever that means to you, right? Like, and we got to put the work in and, and like understand what it even means to us, right? You can't outsource it to your pastor and be like, hey, pastor, tell me what I like, I think and feel and pray for me. And read <laughs> yeah, the Bible yeah, right. For me. Maybe you an know? interpretation, but you, but your own personal salvation, no. Sure, exactly. As a husband, as a father, I can't outsource my role with my family and, 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 and my job as a dad and as a husband and like all that. Like nobody else, you, I can't have my best friend come over and be a better husband for me or be a better father. Like that's a recipe for disaster, right? Like with my fitness, I got to take massive accountability for my own health, for the way I eat, for my diet, for my working out. Like, great, man. Thank you. You know, <laughs> and you know, I got to, I got to do that. If I don't, it, it's going to fall apart. Right. But somehow like all those things are really important because I look at freedom as, is is like holistically, right? Finances are a part of it. Somehow we've been duped into believing that even though we understand we can't outsource the, uh, these other things, which I would deem with money as the four kind of pillars, the most success, the, the, the four most important areas that we need to take accountability for to have freedom in our life because make no mistake about it if you don't get your health right and your family right and your relationship with god right you can hit retirement and and like whatever and you're not free you're you're going to be miserable you're going to be a slave to something you know and so i think you need to do all four of those f's to actually achieve freedom and the problem is we're not take like we've been tricked within the the current financial system to say, listen, just give your money to somebody. You're not capable. This is like my problem with Dave Ramsey. Dave Ramsey thinks you're too stupid to manage your own oh money. Oh my god! You know what I'm saying? Like you must have saw I, my TikTok or something. I literally said those exact words. I said Dave Ramsey thinks that he I totally. Have a quote, and I'll I'll even pull it up after this. But keep keep going, keep going, yeah. keep going. No, so so like I just I just look at it like this: is like if you want to you. I heard Tony Robbins say this one time and it hit me right between the eyes because listen, we're all, we are where we are because of who we are in life. Right. And my, my, what I really believe in one of the reasons I love whole life insurance as a foundational asset is because it gets you really focused on your human life value. And you realize that money is just part of the equation uh, that we are put on this earth. We're here for a short period of time. We have to think about legacy. It's about doing the most with what we have right now, but also creating systems and leaving in our kids, you know, more, not just leaving stuff to them, but teaching them systems, teaching them responsibility, teaching them, you know, principles about how money actually works and what they can do to create more value in the world. And like, to me, um, I, I want my financial, whatever I'm doing with my money, I should say, I want that to be helping propel me forward to grow, to create the life that I want to live. If I'm just giving my, like earning money and giving it to some person to invest for me and putting blind faith in them that they're going to retire, like invest my money and do the best thing for me. I got news for you. That incongruency, the fact that your money is not in alignment with your values and beliefs from that context is the reason we have such a cultural problem around money and why people are failing. And so my why is to get people to open up and wake up and open their eyes to the fact that they are where they are because of who they are and their relationship with money is probably the biggest problem with it because I promise you, you get your money right, you have more money now and you have more clarity and you can prioritize things. So now you want to eat better, you want to go to the gym, you can spend money on a personal trainer if that's your problem. You, you have it, you can handle it, you can eat organic. You can tithe more and give more to your church and feel more fulfilled. You can have more time to take your kids on vacations and spend more time and have more freedom with your family. Like you can show up more powerfully in life. And it all comes down to how do you handle your money? And I believe when we focus on structure and we focus on building from the bottom up, and that's why I love using whole life insurance for that because it's a self-completing plan, then you are able to show up as the most powerful and as the most powerful version of yourself and you, and it puts you in a position and in on a trajectory to grow into becoming who you want to be to live the life that you want to live. 
Man, you said so much stuff that I'm like, right now, I'm mad I don't have like handy dandy. I'm trying to keep notes and stuff at the same time. Cause I'm trying to, I'm trying to learn and like moderate this thing at the same time. So one big thing that you just tied all together through literally whole life insurance, like whole life insurance for you is so much more. You went through sociology, the psychology, uh, the methodology, uh, and even like just the values and morals of society and how money is all tied to that. And I think that's why the gov. I think the government understands that if you think about some of the things and I try to, one of the big things that you said was you talked about the political side of it, that if you think that you can somehow run away from that, then you can't. Uh, one of the comments I got on a previous video, uh, shout out to Nancy. I'm actually helping Nancy get started with a, a infinite banking policy. So nice. of course that's just a whole life policy designed for banking with a mutual company. And, mm -hmm. uh, one of the comments I saw that I saw that was put down and she was like, she was saying, well, I just want to learn about infinite banking. I don't want to per se get into the politics, right. Or the weeds <laughs> of things. Right. <laughs> and I was laughing. I was laughing when I actually viewed the comment. Cause I was like, I, I totally get, get where she's coming from. One thing I having this conversation with you today is why I have this channel the way I have it though, is because for an example, the banking bros, they're going to give you infinite banking until you, you know, to your green in the face, right? That's their thing <laughs> over <laughs> there. And, uh, and, and, um, and, but, but they do an awesome job. They're going to make sure you understand mm -hmm. it. They're going to break it down. They're going to help you become your own bank. Literally what I wanted mm -hmm. for better investments is I think that in life, everything is an investment even, and I, I know this is contradictory to what we believe your policy contract is not an investment per se, mm -hmm. but an investment into why you got whole life insurance is because you invested into yourself mm. and you are the best investment. So if think about it, if you don't protect your life value, who else it will do that? Right? So a job or somebody else might do it, but do you really think they're going to give your family a full death benefit? No, they might give them 10,000 of the $500,000 that they actually have on your life. Right? So you made a, you made an investment into yourself. You made an investment into your own, uh, system of control where you can control your money more, just like you were talking about. So I think yeah. it's important that we don't, we have to, we have to, and that's why I have a truth versus half truths section of this interview, because we need to understand that a lot of the things we've been told are half truths. And it starts mm -hmm. with the government. Donald Trump uh, put, uh, well, allowed in, in, con in connection with the Fed, which is the Central Bank of America, uh, mm -hmm. helped generate another $7 trillion inside of debt. And we yep. received those in the form of PPP loans, stimulus yep. checks, so on and so yeah. forth, which is why he excused the taxes for a certain amount of time. But we ended up having to pay those anyways later on down the road. All inflation does is literally kick the can down the road. It's de not dealing with today's problem so that we can deal with it later on in life. If we don't vote, if we don't, uh, focus on and we don't deal with everything from the political side of things uh, from just the monetary system in itself what's going on with the Fed like you were saying a lot of the things we're using our money for and, what, and the things we're doing literally don't even align with what we actually believe morally so whether it's Republican or Democrat or whatever other part uh, middle middle party that you might believe in and who you whoever you're voting for and you and you value you have to understand that these people are not necessarily having your best interest at heart. These, these individuals all need to be held accountable. So when we talk about these different things is because our nation, where we live, our nationality is just as important as an investment. We need to, we have to reinvest when we spend our dollars and when we give control of our money over to someone else, cause that's what's happening before you get yep. a paycheck and you spend it, what's happening. You got income tax. Then you have to pay taxes again on all the things that you buy. Then you're putting money into a 401k that has taxes and penalties. You know, we have all this, all these things that structured for us to where how much of that dollar, let's say every dollar that you make, how much of that dollar do you actually own and control? I would go yeah. as far as to say maybe one penny, right? Of nine of out of the 100 cents, you might actually own and control one penny. So if we don't understand the system of control that we're in, uh, for, for, you know, to, to kind of give an analogy, if a slave doesn't know it's a slave, it doesn't want freedom. And I think that when we think about slavery in modern day times, it's always, like you said, you're going to be a slave to something if you don't align mm -hmm. everything 
uh, and finding equilibrium. So I think we think of slavery, we always think, oh, it has to be a certain color of people, certain race, or it's a certain uh, demographic of people. And, and even yeah. it has to be something with dealing with racism. Well, mm -hmm. I have a wake up call to why I focus my channel the way I do is because this isn't about black, white, purple, pink. We yeah, are man. all a part of a system of somewhat slavery. And once you understand right. the monetary system, you understand that all of these things that we disagree on, politics, uh, uh, racism, you know, mm -hmm. uh, uh, pro-life, pro-choice, all these other things, yeah. look at what the government's doing. They're taking a step beyond just being your government and stepping into what? Cultural norms, cultural problems, sociology, getting into the society. We need to, if we can control society, we can mm -hmm. keep people distracted from what's going on over here and how we actually run their lives. And more importantly, mm -hmm. if we control the monetary system, the monetary system indirectly controls society. All right, so that's that's my spiel into piggybacking off of everything you just said. And I want okay, so let me go. Let me let me get your boy Dave Ramsey here. He says, "Oh boy, here, here we go." This this is from his sponsored content. So this is straight from Dave. He got the blue check on there. It's not from me. This is straight from Dave. Whole life insurance is the payday lender of the middle class. It's a ripoff, and you don't have to waste your money on it. So let's break down just that section there, and I'm going to speak to what I said about it. Aye, aye, aye. Focus on what he just said. It's the payday lender of the middle class. Are we not talking about borrowing against our death benefits to buy things and having a chance to pay ourselves back? Notice, too, I, I call Dave Ramsey a classist. Jeremiah says, well, I don't know. I told him, I said, no, he's a classist. He's a classist, and here's why. Um, it's almost like I'm calling him a racist. I don't even right? know what a classist is. Okay, <laughs> so a cla I'm going cla admit, admit my ignorance here. I don't even know what a okay, classist cool. is. Okay, cool. So I, I saw your face, and I was like, let me, let me break down what this is. Right. So a classist is somebody, is an individual that believes in almost a class system. They want okay. people to stay where they're at. So let's let's make a pyramid here, and let's say uh -huh. at the bottom we have uh, you have the lower class, middle class, high class. Okay. Dave Ramsey believes, like you said, you're too stupid. The poor yeah. class needs to give their money to the high class. The high class can then dictate and make decisions over that money, and then they trickle the wealth back down to the lower class. Dave uh -huh. Ramsey, in my opinion, personal opinion, that is, is that he's a classist. The reason being is because sure. from his own words the middle class so he's telling you you're not a part of the middle class and you're too broke to actually have whole life insurance it's a ripoff how is it a ripoff he doesn't say why it's a ripoff he immediately goes into the next point term life insurance is the way to go with a 15 to 20 year term life policy you'll get more coverage for a much lower price once again he leaves out a lot of context and details at the end of that 15 to 20 years if you wanted to get that same term policy it would be mm. just as expensive as if you got a whole life policy to start with because now you're older, 15 to 20 years older, you don't have coverage, you need coverage again. And if you try to get term again at that point and your investments did or did not work out, you know, that's still 15 to 20 years later, you're going to have to pay just as much yeah. as you would have paid for a whole life policy to have that term policy again. So he says, um, during that time, you can use the money you save to reach your financial goals, get out of debt, savings, investing, and uh, securing your future. Now, is that not all the same things that we're telling people that they can do with whole life insurance? But they can do it right now. They can borrow from their policies right now and do it. And I, my, my issue is that he never, like I say, he never goes into why it's a ripoff. He's simply just saying well, whole life insurance costs too much. By term, because it's cheaper, you can't afford whole life insurance. You can't afford the on-brand product, the good product. Here's the great value version. Here's what you get. You don't you don't need to focus on that. Yeah, for sure. The thing that I find funny about that is like a lot of people that say, well, whole life insurance can work, but it's only for the wealthy people of the world, right? Like to me, principles are principles are principles and principles are absolute. Like you can have your your beliefs. I can have my beliefs, but principles are absolute. And if if all... The wealthiest people, the wealthiest corporation, the wealthiest, you know, all the most successful banks are all utilizing this. To me, that's that's showing me that there's a principle of success. And one of the first mentors I ever, you know, had that made the biggest impact in my life said, Chris, if you want to be successful, find the people that have the life that you want to live and emulate what they do until you get what they have. And, and that's you know, why Dave it, Ramsey is a classist. <laughs> but yeah, he's so, telling you, yeah, hey, you see what rich people are doing? Those people yeah. are terrible. Yeah. But Dave Ramsey's well, rich. 
But so Dave Ramsey, so let's talk about like, I mean, I don't know how much time you want to spend on this, but like, I, no, yeah, I it's yeah, funny. Yeah, let's dive into it's it. Funny. For I, a just, I literally just, before I hopped on this podcast, I got done optimizing one of my videos. That is why buy term and invested difference is wrong. By, and, and the thumbnail is like, Dave, is Dave Ramsey wrong with a, you know, Dave Ramsey face and me like giving yeah, a weird face and like whatever. But like, it's the whole idea is like, he's convinced people about the fact that Whole life insurance is bad because of several things. A, it's expensive, which is a fallacy when we look at human life value. Um, and I'll, I'll get more into that. I'll circle back to that. It's, it's the fact that you don't keep your cash value. The, the insurance company keeps your cash value when you die. That, that's, a, that's, that's, a, that's a thing he says. And I'll, we'll get into these things, right? Why should you pay to borrow your own money? That's another thing that he says, Right. And so when we, and there was one other thing that the guy said, so like, but anyway, I had this guy leave a YouTube comment and he went oh, through the it, four things. The, that, it makes, yeah. it makes, uh, don't forget, uh, the fourth thing is, I, I, is that it makes a bunch of commissions for the agent and it helps the companies yeah. a lot, but it doesn't actually help the person that buys yeah. it. So, it's, so it's when crazy we look at oh, term, term pays great commissions. So that's crazy, but yeah, yeah, go ahead, go ahead. Well, in term, like what is it, what is the actual cost when 99.1% of the time, uh, term doesn't pay out? You know, like it term is a more profitable product for the life insurance company because of I the thought. fact that they hardly ever have to pay a death benefit out when with whole life insurance, they always have to pay a death benefit out eventually. Right. And so it's a function of that. And so so when we look at it, like the whole buy term and invested difference concept, I'll say this. I agree with it. You, I mean, I, I in, in the sense of if you're looking at whole life insurance as an investment, then I would say, all right, that's fair. I agree with it. But like, we shouldn't even be looking at it like that. Like if you're looking at buying term and invested difference as your philosophy, I would argue that your money is not in alignment with your values and beliefs and that you don't even understand what you're trying to accomplish in life and that your money is not in alignment with helping you create the life that you want to live. And so like you, that mindset is a zero sum game. That mindset is saying, I'm going to give up control of my financial success versus what we need to be thinking is, Am I focusing on financial structure? And the funniest thing that I, th I find about Dave Ramsey on all this is that he will be the number one advocate to tell every single person on this earth that they need an emergency fund, right? I mean, everybody yes. needs yeah. to have six months of savings. Yeah, the, yeah. Best, the best hands down place in the world to keep an emergency fund is your whole life insurance contract, period, hands down, not a questions asked. I will debate any person on the face of the earth about that topic, yet he wants to focus on the investment alternative, not like, well, hey, where, where are you keeping your safe money? Where are you keeping that emergency fund? Well, this and, channel is better investment, so I don't, I don't wanna cut your, cut your knowledge here, but let's take it from right here where you're at before you move forward. Yeah. So we're on the better investment channel, uh, and we're talking about, we're breaking down finances, right? So mm -hmm. term as an investment, let's look at it from like exactly what you just said. If 99% of the time the person that buys it loses, like think about the stock market. If 99% of people lost, mm -hmm. even the stock market produces more winners than that, right? Sure. If 99% of the time you lose, is that actually a better investment? Is that a good investment? Well, no. I mean, look, but, but here's the deal. Like once again, um, term insurance has its role. Like I'm a big believer in term yeah. insurance. If as a supplemental thing, you know, if you don't, it, cause life is all about cash flow. Like there are going to be times like you're like, I got a wife and three kids. I got to tell, I have term insurance, right? I have whole life. I have, you know, but I have term to supplement it because from a cash flow perspective and, and, and from a str strategic perspective, I want to make sure my family, um, has maximized my human life value from an insurance perspective. And from a cash perspective, um, and whole life policies being optimized for cash value, just can't get it done, you know? So like I need to supplement yeah. that human life value with term and it locks in my insurability so I can convert it at another time, right? So like, like there's that. But here's, here's what I also wanna say, what I love about whole life insurance is when you focus on structure, Warren Buffett talks about this a lot. Do you mind if I write this out a little bit and draw this out go for ahead. a second? No, go ahead, go ahead, go so, ahead. So, so like, um, check this out. So if, if, if we look at this, right, and, um, this is this is the biggest thing. We got to think about life in, in building our safe foundation first. I, that's why I do this thing called the Life One Eighty Pyramid, and and we talk about building your financial safety. Unfortunately, most people have done this. They 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 go out. We're taught the younger we are, the more risk we can take. So people don't save money. There's a sixty four percent of Americans 
are living paycheck to paycheck, right? So there's no safe money. There's no savings. There's no whatever. We're all taught, go out and save for retirement in a 401k, but you're not saving for retirement. You're investing for retirement. So what happens is as we go through life, we go through these market cycles. We have one time where because you have no safe, safe money, all your money's in high risk assets. You go for a decade feeling like you're really good. You got a 40 year time frame. What happens is you lose 40% of your money all the time. And if your whole financial life is built on this one point of instability, it, you, you lose. Now, on the other side of things, what we teach people with financial structure is build your financial foundation. Because when you do this, you're not an investor. You are a speculator. Make no mistakes about it because you are mm. always exposed to market risk and you are one bad year away from your whole financial life falling over. That's it, right? But when we focus on building a foundation, yes, it's going to go a little slower. It's going to take you a little time to build that foundation and, and have it built right. But once you do, now you can start doing some medium risk, longer term investments. And if you want to get into the higher risk stuff like crypto and all that stuff, like, listen, I have no problem with crypto. I, I, I love taking high risk. I was a professional poker player for crying out loud. So like, I have no problem with risk and variance and all that stuff. But think about it this way. If I build this foundation up, let's take the same scenario where this happened over here. Now it goes here. And we lose half, like half of our high risk investments, right? It doesn't matter. We still got the rest of our pyramid here. It's going to rebuild like no problem. But that's, and this, by the way, right here is what Warren Buffett talks about and teaches. And like Mark Cuban, I heard a thing the other day with him talking about the fact that, you know, the most important thing you can do right now is have cash on hand and make sure you're liquid and make sure that you are actually positioned to be an investor. This is an investor profile. Companies, corporations understand the concept of cash flow and liquidity. That is what this is. Americans and Canadians have been duped into believing this is just what you need to do. Go to school, get a job, don't save your money, just live paycheck to paycheck, put your money in high risk 401ks, wait, ride the market cycles, and then every 10 years when the market crashes, you got to start over and you're screwed. And that's what happens. Man, dude, I mean, honestly. We got to get, you got to be an instructor or something at Better Investments, dude. You just, <laughs> <laughs> he like, nah, this is how you be an investor right here. And what's crazy is <laughs> you're exactly right. That what people don't understand is that just like you were talking about with the yields, what they do. Yeah. The government is controlling these cycles, man. The gov well, the government in conglomerate with the Fed, they're controlling these cycles. So you have to think about it. They already know and understand when the market mm -hmm. drops, we raised, we raised the, we raise it, right? We, we're going, we're raising yields. What is that going to do? The banks are more stingy. We don't want to give out loans for properties. We were only going to give it to the top tier, uh, top tier customers, top tier companies, businesses. We don't. Money is not loose. When the yields are down, money is loose. That's why the markets are taking off. They're running. They're running. They're running. But think about it. When it crashes, when whether it's a housing market, crypto stocks, whatever the case is, when you want to buy it the most, yep. because you don't have the pyramid set up as an investor, just like Chris is saying. You don't have any liquidity. You don't have any dry powder to then deploy into the market. You can't take advantage of a low Bitcoin. You can't take advantage of a low Ethereum or XRP. You can't take advantage estate. of low housing yeah. housing prices, rentals, yeah. land, uh, even different uh, acquisitions and mergers, so on and so forth. You can't take advantage of this stuff. And if you pay attention, like I said, during whether it was during COVID, during 2008, a lot of people got hurt, but a lot of people became multi-millionaires billionaires and even going on to be trillionaires why because they understand that it is a wealth cycle it is a boom and bust and if you understand how to ride that wave right yeah. get on that roller coaster understand when the dips and the churns are coming you can be a better investor so like he said there's a difference between being a speculator and being an investor a speculator has no thesis you're simply mm -hmm. in the market and it's almost as if you went to uh, the casino. A speculator has All no right. thesis. They don't know why Bitcoin is a buy. They don't know why Ethereum is a buy. They don't know why it's a good time to get into real estate or what what type of uh, in investor they are because they're not an investor. They simply speculate. An investor has some kind of fundamental grounding behind why they do what they do. And that's what no. Chris, it speaks perfectly to what you were talking about. Money doesn't align with people's morals and values nowadays. And, and listen, I, uh, the thing that I love the most about this is the process, the process of building this foundation and doing this, you know, and spending the time to do this first, especially for people your age, you know, that are younger, that are just getting this journey started, the process of building that you're going to grow so much. You're going to learn 
so much in that process that by the time you've built this foundation, you're going to be so much more advanced. You're going to have so much more clarity. You're going to have like so much more understanding of what you are looking to accomplish that by the time it comes time to invest in medium or high risk stuff, you're going to know why you're doing it. You're going to know how it's in alignment with your beliefs and it's going to reduce your margin of error. I'm not going to say that you're going to be perfect and then you're never going to make a mistake because God knows we all do and, and it is what it is, but it's going to increase your likelihood of success and your chances of success. And I, I use this analogy um, you're younger than me. Uh, so I don't know if you remember the company. Do you remember the company BASF? So, um, no, I don't. What, what did they do? No, so in the nineties, there was, there was always these commercials, like on the NFL, when I'd watch the NFL every, every, every week. And, uh, they had a BASF NASCAR, BASF sponsored a NASCAR, you know, and it was BASF. It, they had these commercials that would go all the time. They didn't make any products. What they did is they had stuff. They said at BASF, we don't make the fishing line you use. We make it stronger. We don't make the, the paint you use. We make it brighter. We don't use like, mm -hmm. we don't make this. We make it better. Right? Like, so that was their tagline at BASF. We don't make the products you buy. We make the products you buy better. That was their, that was how every commercial ended. So here's the deal. Whole life insurance isn't the investment you make. It simply makes the investments you make better by having it there because it's going to allow you to be more impactful with all the investments you make if you get whole life insurance put into place first. Okay, cool. So the system of of putting putting deposits into the system, uh, our banking mm -hmm. system, it then yeah. buys our death benefit. We borrow from that death benefit and we, uh, we can now use that money tax-free, right? You, you can access it tax free. The only the only caveat I would say is a you're accurate with saying you're borrowing from the death benefit, but you're really uh, I, I want to make sure people aren't confused because they're like, if we put money in and we got a million dollar death benefit, we can't borrow a million dollars right away. We can only correct, borrow against the correct. cash value. It's a the stated cash value. value that yep. that it's a is it is a, a compounding stated value. Correct. That you can borrow from the right. death benefit. I like I like the way you corrected me on on the on the on the explanation because this. I mean, like you said, every we want to like I said, and we're going to move into the truth versus half truths. Yeah, yeah. Um, we went into Dave Ramsey a little bit early that, but he didn't even have some half truths. Some some of those were just no, lies. No. Uh, yeah, totally. <laughs> so, uh, but but the um, so I want to make sure that I'm I'm sticking the closest to the truth as possible. Totally, it's a stated wow. value that increases at a compounding rate over the course of your lifetime and cash yeah. value inside of a banking policy should equal, it should grow to equal the death benefit because cash value is the death benefit, right? So mm -hmm. uh, with that being said is we can do tax-free investing, right? How, mm -hmm. how, how much, like you were saying, it makes it stronger. If I can mm -hmm. get, let's say 4% in my policy, if we, if we were to do dividends and I can go and get another, 10% in the markets or even maybe an infinite return doing real estate. How does those two coming together? How is that better than just me doing the, the, the direct investment with what's my capital? Well, just like you were saying with that company, what is it doing? It's making it stronger, right? Mm -hmm. It's making it better. And so at, and you know, on this channel, better investments, we want, we want to make a better investment because better investments equals a better future. So I want to dive yeah. into now, what have you done with uh, with IBC? Uh, so the infinite banking concept, which of course is like you would like to refer to it, and I think is a is a is a good way to say it, is cash flow insurance is what it is. Yeah. So yeah. Uh, what have you been able to do with your policies? I know I'm I'm sure you have more than one, right? So mm -hmm. what have what have you been able to do with the policies? Uh, some of the things on the investing side of things. Give give me one or two investments you've been able to. Well, I mean, just like when you look at what we're doing um, for real estate, um, you know, like put it this way, the uh, the opportunities just down in the Dominican Republic alone, liquid liquidity is everything. You can't get financing down there. So whenever you have the ability to have access to capital, um, it opens up opportunity. Um, and so there's like here. Here's the thing is that like and it just goes back to, you know, what I'm showing here is I, I, I believe we don't want to make money. I'm going to just say it this way, right? Like I believe we don't make money. This is this is what most people do, right? The markets go up 
and they come down and then they go up and come down. And you'll notice that there's a trajectory that it's, it's going up. But the problem is everybody tries to make money in these periods of time when the reality is this is where you need make to make money, money on a dip. Yeah. Right. Right. Because what happens is because everybody's structured like this. And when, when we have a down cycle right here, this is where people's lives fall over financially and they got to, you know, that's where opportunity is created. So the whole idea of what we preach is become an opportunistic investor profile and take advantage of these market cycles. And so, so when you ask like, what have I done? Like that is just the philosophy is like, you just wait. And sometimes it takes longer. Uh, sometimes you just, you have, you have to look for those cycles. But I think that's one of the things that I love that Nelson Nash talks about all the time is like, the, the more you have in these things, uh, the more prepared you are, the more opportunity has a way of tracking you down. Right. Like, and that's, Got it. I think the biggest thing, um, you know, and I, and I would say like, I wouldn't be in the Dominican Republic right now doing the fund and, you know, doing the three, you know, we're building three Airbnbs right now and doing all that stuff. I wouldn't be doing that without this. And guess what? Those investments and opportunities crush any real estate opportunity from a cash flow perspective that you'll find in the United States. Yeah, because it's it's a it's a you're pioneering. You're inside of yeah. a new plane. Yeah. Yeah, well, and then too the competition. Uh, when you have that first mover's advantage, competition, mm-hmm. which is great because that's part of a free market. And of course, we're Austrian economists here. <laughs> uh, but uh, at the same time, when you have that first mover's advantage, you get to take the market and you kind of control pricing and you kind of control. Well, you just have more control in general before somebody else comes in to compete with you. And so that's a part of being a better investor, man, is knowing when to get in, seeking out opportunities and, and having uh, the fruition to know uh, what, what's a good location and and what's going to be a good investment. So I want to dive in now. uh, This is truth versus half truths. And uh, this segment is going to be, what would Curtis do? All right. Oh boy, here we go. Yeah. Yeah, we got oh, we got no, G, we got Jesus of the IUL. You're gonna get me in so, trouble, buddy. You're gonna get me in trouble. <laughs> no, you, okay. Here hey, we go. Man, I, I'm trying. I'm trying to. Um, I'm trying to avoid some defamation too on this end. So we're gonna yeah, take no, his exact good. words from audio. All right. So one of the first things that uh, that Curtis says is that whole life insurance does not have level premiums. The cost of insurance actually does rise over the time that you get older. It's just not shown inside the contract. You have to call and ask the company about it. Okay. I, your your oh. face is telling me a lot right now without you saying anything. So go ahead it's, and speak on it. <laughs> listen, um, this is the thing with IUL versus whole life. And, and and listen, he's obviously an IUL guy, right? And so um, the answer is nobody really knows. Um, that's that's the real answer. Um, the 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 what I can tell you is that your premiums are fixed with whole life. Your premiums are guaranteed with whole life. And when you look at an illustration, I can look at a current assumption illustration and know that the only variable to that illustration is what are the dividend payouts going to be, right? And if I'm working with a company that's paid a dividend for 120 plus years, um, consecutively in every market environment, in every recession, in every depression, in every war, in every everything, you know, and a lot of these companies paid dividends, by the way, during the Civil War. Like, that's how old this is. Like, you think about this. Yeah. This has been happening. Like, the year Lincoln got assassinated, companies were paying dividends <laughs> successfully. Think about that. Like, so, to like, add some context to it, he did concede <laughs> that IULs, he conceded that IULs, because, I, of course, I challenged him and debated him on a lot of the things. He conceded okay. that for one, IULs do go up over the course of your lifetime. It becomes way, uh, a lot more expensive as you get older. And also sure. he conceded that 90 to 95 percent of IULs lapse around 70 to 76 years old. He conceded to that as well. So uh, so that is. Right. We'll, but he's we'll, going we'll go to tell you that he designs them better. So that's just. Oh, yeah. He, he has a oh, he yeah. has a he well, has a magical formula oh, that I tried to yeah. I tried to get some of that out of him as well. But I couldn't seem to get a to get a good st- uh, a, a statement ah, on how yeah. exactly he he changes it from from doing it what uh, 90 to 95 percent of the market does. So also too. Uh, adding in there. So you said that the level there they are level premiums and they're fixed. Whether or not the cost of insurance is rising, uh, that's kind of another ballpark. But right. the level, the premium is leveled versus an IUL, Index Universal Life Policy. It is not leveled. 
Let's go into right. the next thing. He yeah. said IULs can be used for banking. MPI is Infinite Banking 2.0. And um, I don't know how Infinite that, Banking hasn't sued him over that, but okay. Well, Infinite Banking never got trademarked. You gotta you gotta keep in oh, mind yeah, that yeah. uh our Nelson Nash is no longer with us. So yeah. in terms of IULs being used for banking, one thing I'm gonna go ha- go ahead and add some context to it. IULs have a probational period where you can't pull money out right away. So that in itself is why it's, it differs from infinite banking because we can take loans right away from our policy. You can't do that with IUL. Also, too, so uh, which he which he conceded on, and also he conceded to the fact that it is a more of a long term retirement plan than it is uh, than it is a banking system. But he had to, of course, ride the wave, man. He had to say. Uh, infinite infinite banking uh, 2.0 is what I is what MPI is. That's what MPI the strategy is. Is infinite banking 2.0. So, so speak, speak to that. Let me ask you this: Did you ask him what his interpretation of infinite banking was? Yes, uh, he says he's read R. Nelson Nash book. Here's another thing he said: An IUL fits what R. Nelson Nash describes as a banking system. He only suggested whole life based on the 1980s economics. Because, of mm. course, infinite uh, IULs in the Index Universal Life didn't come out until 1997, which is when I was born. So I'm okay. older than the IULs, by the way. You were born in 97? Yes, that, I'm, I'm older the than the IULs. Oh, we're the same age. Same, yeah, Transamerica launched it that year. That's funny. So so here's the deal. Oh, man, you're young. I was a junior in high school in 97. The um, So... Um, Here's the deal. Uh, you cannot do infinite banking with uh, with IUL. If you read any IUL contract, this is my problem with, and I'll just say it with MPI. Um, and people will disagree with me. Um, you know, I, I I know Curtis disagrees with me. Absolutely, obviously, right. Um, but <laughs> yeah. then there's other people like Rocky. Uh, you know, I never say his like Di, Di Francesco or whatever, who's um, like one of the biggest IUL. Um, people in the world who loves IUL, right? So Rocky and I don't agree on anything pretty much, but you know what we agree on? That MPI is never going to work. That's what we agree on. And so mm. even the number one IUL guy, like, and he's a, he's an attorney. He's got all, you got to fix me up with Rocky, man. I got to, I got to yeah. speak with Rocky too. Like even Rocky, who I don't agree with on anything, we agree on the fact that MPI is not good for anybody. That's, that's just our, our belief. And so, um, and that's backed up by math because like, here's the deal, the problem. So here's, here's my problem with IUL. And, and when we look at infinite banking, we've talked about this already. So I'm going to like kind of rehash just for three seconds. What is the purpose of infinite banking? It is to put you at the center of your financial success. It is a financial tool that's going to help you become who you need to be to live the life that you want to live. Right? Like, let's just keep it as simple as that. Right? It's, it's a self-completing plan. That puts you at the center of your own success. And so when you, and, and even Curtis Ray said it himself, it's more of a long-term investment plan. It's more of an alternative to a 401k. And so it's still a zero sum Terminology is important. Investment, banking. Exactly. You're saying something completely different. Yeah. Exactly. You can't talk out of both sides of your mouth, Curtis. Mm-hmm. Like you have to take a look and realize like, what what is the purpose of this? You are you basically when you do an IUL. Let's not even talk about MPI because I don't want to get like another notice from his attorneys because they keep sending me things. It's absurd. Like <laughs> like let's not even talk about MPI. Let's just talk about IUL. When people try to convince you that any kind of IUL, I don't care if it's this IUL 2.0 crap that he's doing. Like even that, like it's an IUL. It's infinite banking 2.0. Even yeah, but he he calls it IUL 2.0 too. Like it's insane. Uh, oh, like, oh, he got a lot of. Okay. It's IUL. I didn't know that that, he got that's that one too. all okay. it is. It's <laughs> IUL that you're using loans from the policy to get more like stuff and trying to use positive arbitrage and all this stuff, and it just doesn't work that way. Like, but if you want to go really deep into this, I'll go really deep into it with you and and like show you. But like, it, it's here. Here's the deal. The biggest thing with IUL that I have a problem with is that it hasn't solved. The problem of aligning your money with your values and beliefs and you haven't you're not leveraging your money to help you create your life that you want to live you're basically saying okay i'm buying this story that the government is bad i'm buying the story that taxes are bad and the risks going forward are bad 
and you're simply trading, putting the government in control of your money and putting a life insurance company in control of your money. Because remember, make no mistake about it. When you sign on the dotted line with a whole life insurance policy with a mutual participating mutual company, you are a shareholder of that company. You are a business partner of that company that is sharing in the profits of that company. When you sign on the dotted line for an IUL, you are now a profit center of that company. Make no mistake about it. If you don't believe me, go back and look at UL, traditional UL, which is basically all IUL is, is a traditional UL platform with an option strategy attached to it. And I like, listen, I could go on for hours about this, right? Yeah. Like, and, I already and, and, know that that's another episode, right? <laughs> like, so like, that's all IUL is, is a traditional UL with a, with an option strategy attached to it. And, and when you look at how, and uh, all these people that say, oh, you know what? I'm okay giving, like taking the government out of the equation and putting the, the insurance company in charge of my, my financial future and being a profit center for them because IUL companies are going to be moral and they're going to treat me well and they're going to, they're not going to do anything to screw me over. Guess what? Go back and do a little, little review on history and see how they treated all the people that had UL policies from the 80s and 90s. And when oh, yeah, all that's those why the universal life uh, kind of faded out is because of that. Oh. And, and what's crazy is all they did was slap index on there. And it's like, oh, well, you can take advantage of the stock market, too. What's and crazy, when, and uh, when, by the way, that story of upside potential, downside protection because of market participation that's being sold. Go read the mutual mutual of Omaha, which is what most MPI is sold as. Go read that illustration. And it says on there. It's not designed to be, it's not meant to be sold as upside potential because of all this market exposure. It's upside potential compared to a traditional universal life policy. That's well, it. You, you saw the notice that, that was sent out. I know Mass Mutual sent one out, but the Department of Insurance sent one out talking mm -hmm. about IULs and the fact that they have to, uh, they sent out a notice of how they're being uh, illustrated and they're being sold that basically a forewarning that if they don't start reconstructing those to show more realistic, uh, more realistic values, there's going to be an issue because a lot of people are, of course, upset about what they're what they're actually finding out yeah. later on down the road. Uh, and yeah. so, one big thing to speak to as well is that if you read the IU uh, an index universal life contract, is that it's letting you know right then and there that things can change. It's not a guaranteed contract things can change. And so most of the time, whenever you sign a contract with a party and things can change nine times out of 10, things are going to change. Right. Because <laughs> think about it. If I, if I enter into a deal with you and I have a, and there's a, and I'm an opportunist because that's what most businesses are. And even entrepreneurs is not, it's not necessarily makes them bad, but they are opportunists. If you know yeah. the hand sanitizer sales for double the amount of money during a pandemic, you up the price, right? So uh, same thing here. If they're inside a contract with you, they're more likely going to make some kind of changes to where they have uh, an arbitrage situation that benefits them. Now, I'm going to dive into two more things, and then we're going to go into a couple more truth versus half truths, and we'll wrap it up. So I know, I know you're an important right. person. You got some things to do. All right. Uh, we have here market gains are compounded with the guaranteed interest rates in an IUL. Now, my rebuttal to this is that the market gains are not compounded. They are added into the into the uh, into the policy. They can be locked in. There's a floor that keeps you from losing those. But the market gains themselves are not compounded. So that's a statement that he made. Speak to that. All right. This is my favorite thing to talk about. Um, so. Man, how to get in. So, so one of the, I, I could go, I could literally talk about this topic for an hour uh, because it's that complicated. And that's my biggest problem with Index Universal Life is it's a very complicated product that's sold as a very simple solution, right? When in Correct. fact, it is not simple. And all this simpletonness that's sold that uh, MPI is this simple, innovative solution that's pretty much uh, more predictable to get you where you want to go is bullcrap. Like that, that is what it is. Now, Here's the deal. Um, one of the biggest, uh, I guess to answer this, one of the biggest marketing phrases that's used is you cannot lose money due to market loss, right? That's, mm -hmm. that's, 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 that's the idea in, because you got a 0% floor. They say you cannot lose money due to market loss. I gotta, I gotta, I gotta write this out because this is something that is very visual. So they say you can't lose money due to market loss because like maybe you have a 10% cap, right? and a 0% floor. 
So they say, whatever the market does, you could earn up to 10%, but if the market goes super negative, you're, you're capped at zero, so you can't lose money. That's the idea, right? Now, they will argue that you have uh, expenses, insurance costs, all that stuff. So yeah, that, that'll come out. But at the end of the day, you can't lose money uh, due to market loss. But you know what you can? You can lose money in the policy because of market loss. And that little shift of due to, from that to because of, right, market loss, is a huge deal because what happens is we have to think about as soon as you take a loan against your policy in an IUL, you're injecting risk into the policy because what you're doing is you have a 5% loan rate, right? Mm -hmm. So when we look at a 5% loan rate and, and as we're taking, let's say, well, let's say we got like uh, $1,500,000 of cash value in, a, in an IUL plan, right? What's mm -hmm. happening, and, and this is my problem with MPI, is, is that when you borrow against a policy at any point in time, you're starting to inject risk into that policy. My problem with MPI is you typically start taking loans in, in year three to four, right? So now all of a right. sudden you're, and, and, and on the illustration, it looks really good because you have 50 basis points of positive arbitrage throughout the entirety of the policy. But the reality is, is about 25% of the time, you're, you're looking at the policy is actually going to perform worse then the cost of money at 5%. So instead of having positive arbitrage, it's going to inject more costs and fees into it, yet nobody talks about that, right? And so what's mm -hmm. happening is if I got 1.5 million and then I start taking 100K per year, let's go down, you know, uh, 10 years, we've got, we've taken a million dollars out, right? But what have we done? We've been paying 5% on that already. And so it's going to illustrate really well because of positive arbitrage. But we've really got maybe $1,500,000 in actual loan expense. But here's the deal. Because of that, it's worked on positive arbitrage. The net cash value has probably dropped to about $400,000. But it's always going to allow us to take the $100,000 a year of income out, even though our cash value is only $400,000, because there's going to be this accumulated value column that's going to be even bigger. The, the accumulated value is going to grow, and it's probably going to be like, I don't know, $3 million, right? So if we look at that, and I know this is like all over the map, but that's what I'm talking about. This is like complicated stuff, right? And so, but yeah. here's the deal. We lose money not due to market loss because you can't lose your money. You got the 0% floor, but here's what's happening. And this is what MPI does. Your loan balances start accumulating and they never go away, right? So that injects risk. Correct. So now I've got this one and a half million dollar loan balance right here. The first year the market does zero, right? I've now got a $400,000 cash value, net cash value that works on the illustration because of the positive arbitrage. But now what happens is what happens the year that the market does zero and I've got this 5% cost. Well, now I got to take this 100K. I've got my 100K in income because I'm banking on that 100K. If I don't have that 100K in my life, my life is in trouble. Fair enough. Mm -hmm. Because People like Curtis want to get me to put all my money in these plans thinking that they're, they're the cat's meow. And so I got to take my 100K out of this four, 400,000, right? But what else happens on a 0% year? I got to pay 5% interest on 1.5 million. What is that? Exactly. That's 75K. More, more than that is even the bigger, the bigger scope of it is that if you do make a mark, if, if, if the market goes up, the month, the contract is not compounding the the guaranteed rate on an IUL is about two percent. It doesn't matter. So, the guaranteed rate won't even come into play. Like it's. But the whole point is, is that they don't take market gains and then add them to the guaranteed comp, the guaranteed interest rate. The interest no, rates you're no. being paid on premiums are completely separate from any yeah, market gains that you would make, anyways. You're not even making. You're always exposed to the index. And look at this. When they say you can't lose due to market loss. Guess what? In this year, let's say the market didn't even have a negative 20% year. Let's say the market had a 0% year. Okay. Which means Just your a, money did not grow that whole entire year. Which correct? means your money didn't grow. What happens is I take my 100K out and I have $75,000 of loan expenses. That doesn't get handled by the credits that are credited due to the market gain, which is what the positive arbitrage shows on the illustration. And they will never show you this on an illustration, by the way. This $400,000 of cash value has to be has to pay 
for this $175,000. So now all of a sudden I only have $225,000 left of cash value. That increases my net amount at risk. That increases my cost of insurance and all the charges in the policy that makes it so the policy is massively inefficient. And if this happens to you two or three times in retirement, you are toast. Well, bingo, man, you just hit the next one. So the next one was you can retire three times wealthier than traditional retirement plans because of the guaranteed oh, uninterrupted compound compounding inside of an IUL. So you've already yeah. hit that on the head. So yeah. man, on, on our next episode of what would Curtis do? Make sure you stay, stay tuned for that one. Uh, we're, we're gonna, we're gonna bring that to you. <laughs> uh, we got, we got some more fun stuff coming for you, but that, that's all I know. That's all you can handle right now. I don't want you to pop no nerves in your, in your head. <laughs> 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 because, because I'm gonna tell you what, what index universal life reminds me of is and i and i love investing uh, yeah. uh, i'm a serial investor precious metals uh crypto market uh the equities market yeah, for man. you people at home equities just mean stocks um but uh, a number of different things with that as well so uh and and what an iul reminds me of is when i was a kid i didn't like getting on roller coasters okay i still kind of don't to this day it reminds me of that big scary roller coaster at six flags I don't know if you're familiar with like the Goliath. I, I love it. It's, I love it's the one. Yeah, you, you're, yeah, you're crazy. Let's you're go. crazy. But I will might be for you, man. I will yeah, might be yeah. for you. <laughs> no, it's not. It, it, remind, <laughs> it reminds me of the Goliath. And it's like, ooh, and I'm going to take you ooh. all around the park okay. and so on and so forth. And my whole, my whole thing is that you don't control the ride and you don't know exactly when you get off. You don't know when it stops. So um, that, that's what it reminds me of. And it's a scary thing. And when I'm talking about investing, it doesn't sound like there's any fundamentals there. It just sounds like a speculative investment. So truth and half truths. Uh, we'll, we'll run through two, two or three of these and I'm, and I'm going to wrap it up with you, man. Uh, yeah, man. Let's go to, into some of the things that we made the points of on the last, because this does, like we said, all this impacts the personal financial side of things. Uh -huh. uh, so we talked about, a couple a few things in our last uh interview and if you guys if you haven't saw it make sure you go and click uh on the channel and scroll down inside of the the breakdown playlist you'll see it i believe it's interview number three so okay. chris gracefully came on and uh helped me out when the channel was first getting started so with that being said is uh minimum wage minimum wage raising minimum wage is a good thing true for half truth why Got gotcha. you. Okay, cool. Next, <laughs> next, next thing here. Uh, student loan, student loans can be forgiven without uh, raising taxes. True for half truth. Lie. Like I, I mean, I, like I, I, I'm happy we agree to these things. So I'm like, these are none of these are half truth. These are not half truth. <laughs> these, these are, are all, these, bold, are like, lies, lies. Right? these are lies. Yeah, yeah, yeah. These are lies. Okay, okay. Um, cool. Uh, next thing is uh social security mm -hmm. will social security will not actually fail it uh they can increase they can increase the, the debt ceiling and social security is the most secure way to make sure that everybody has uh security inside of their older age with the government planning um so the government thinks that social security is stable it won't is is even though we've heard a lot of different things about it uh, they believe that they can budget, uh, manage, manage the budget, as they say, the the def the deficit uh, to where Social Security will survive into the future and you have nothing sure. to worry about. Truth or half truth? I mean, I'll say half truth simply because, um, you know, it goes back to like aligning your money with your values and beliefs. And there are plenty of liberal people out there that would disagree with me. And so like, uh, there, like I would say there's no guarantees in life um, that I the government has proven it's got a really great ability of kicking the can down the road and manipulating that's things. what i said i think it's a half truth because they're you willing know? to print their way they're going to try to print their way out of this thing i think so who knows? yeah i mean it could be half truth, but i would argue like you just make sure like i i could tell you this i i think it's a lie personally i'll give it a half truth but personally mm -hmm. i'm not acting like i'm expecting anything from social security because it's not in alignment with my values and my beliefs right so i would say yeah, for yeah. you at home like really a lot, like figure out what do you believe? Like, what are your values? And like, do you want to rely on something that's in, you know, uncorrelated with those values? Got you. Tax the rich. We need to tax the rich. Yeah. I mean, if you want to ruin true the for half truth. Yeah. If you want to ruin the economy, go for it. 
Sure, right? Hey, they're just gonna raise those taxes and let's yep. one thing about it is uh the saying is don't poke a bear. Mm-hmm. Well, if you if I own your job, you probably don't want to come to work and and, and make me mad, right? I mean, because you yeah. you wouldn't go and yell at your boss, and that's kind of what we're doing with the whole tax tax the rich scenario. I have an idea. Let's let's go out. I mean, it's the Atlas Shrugged argument, right? Like like let's go out. And if any anybody hasn't watched the movie Atlas Shrugged, just go watch it, right? Like this will explain everything. Let's go find the most productive people in the world that are increasing our standard of living and our quality of life and all these things. And let's go take the people that have produced the most value in this world and made your life better and punish all them entrepreneurs. for it. Yeah, Let's go they're all entrepreneurs. They're they're all business people. What's crazy right. is you won't find any of these people in the White House. I don't care if it's Republican, no, Democrat. You won't find them in any political arena or building at all. Uh, right. this, and also, I noticed too when people agree with this whole tax to rich thing, they failed to uh, delegate in their minds that the politicians are rich. So if they really had the same philosophy that you have and hold dear of tax the rich, uh, wouldn't the wouldn't they just take a pay cut? Well, you know, you know why they're the rich, and this goes back to what we were saying before, because they control everything. At the end exactly. of the day. You know? Exactly. And that's and why so, and that's why we believe in what we believe in is because what we want more control over our assets. We want more control over our money. And that's and that's what we got into. So today, guys, we unpacked a lot of stuff. Chris, I want to <laughs> I want to thank you for coming on to the show, man, yeah, man uh, for fun. another episode of The Breakdown, dude. I told you we had to do a part two because it was awesome. And and, and I think and Curtis just gave us some fireworks. So I appreciate it. Thank you, do. too, Curtis. Thank you. Don't, thank don't you. forget you are you on the next episode of What Would Curtis Do? Um, there you go. I, I tried to get the footage from our interview. I only have the audio because for whatever reason, uh, his guy, Boris, doesn't doesn't want to send me over the footage. Uh, oh, I wonder we, why that, that is. Yeah, yeah I, I, I thought so, too. Maybe, oh, you maybe interviewed on put, his channel? Not on his channel, per se. The platform that we used, it was to where I could only control half of it and, and not the other half of it, which is which is different because normally when people interview, they come onto your platform, right? I wonder so, um, I wonder why he's trying to control it so much. Maybe uh, kind of kind of it's kind of like the uh, it reminds me of mainstream media that if you can control mm. one side of one side of an mm. argument and you don't mm. let the misinformation and you just trust the science or whatever the case is, you know, Damn. if we can control the narrative, maybe maybe uh, and, and we can't put a face with the words, then, mm. you know, maybe um, maybe it's less believable. So, man, I appreciate you coming on to the show, guys. Better <laughs> investments good, equals a better future. Thank you for tuning in. Make sure you leave a like, subscribe. Uh, also, to comment below on the video. Let us know some of the things that we can answer for you. Talk about economics, money, building wealth. Let us know how we can help you guys at home. Thank you for being a part of this channel uh, and, and you know subscribing to it. And we hope that we can provide more and more value for you guys. Once again, thank you, Chris, uh, for all that you've done and the value that you provided. Yeah, I learned a lot today. I can't wait to watch this at home. Uh, so I know a lot of people also can't wait for that. Until next time, guys, better investments equal a better future, and I'll see you guys inside the next video.